In his classic work on Great Lent, Father Alexander Schmemann writes, when a man leaves on a journey, he must know where he is going. Thus with Lent, above all, Lent is a spiritual journey and its destination is Easter, the Feast of Feasts. It is the preparation for the fulfillment of Pascha, the true revelation. Our Lenten journey began this year on February the 13th, the Sunday of the publican and Pharisee. At Vespers, we opened the book known as the Triodion, which contains all the services for Great Lent through Holy Week and Great Saturday. It is undoubtedly one of the most solemn of our liturgical texts with its unyielding emphasis on repentance and return. Like all our hymnology, it is rich in theology and spiritual instruction. It reminds us that without the Paschal event, theologizing about creation, the fall of man and the, de the, and the need for redemption would be irrelevant. The resurrection of the Son of God is the cornerstone of our faith. We know this because we witness in our faith and worship that which was handed down to us from the apostles and the fathers of the church. On the day of Pentecost, speaking to the multitudes, gathered in Jerusalem for the feast, Peter recounts the work of Christ with particular emphasis on the resurrection. And he says, Jesus of Nazareth, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Later on, St. Paul would emphasize the church's conviction regarding the centrality of the resurrection in his first epistle to the Corinthians. If Christ has not been risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. The importance of Pascha, its uniqueness to the faith, was proclaimed unambiguously in the early Christian community, which very early on established a period of preparation for its celebration, eventually to be known as Great Lent. Lent is not an end in itself. It was instituted by the church as a means of penitential preparation, as well as a period of preparation for baptism. The tradition of the fast is an early one, but originally, neither the duration nor the strictness of the fast was definite. One source informs us, it seems the earliest Christians kept complete fasting, that is complete abstention from food for two days or 40 hours, the time from the crucifixion to the resurrection, during which Christ was under the power of death. And uh, Eusebius, a church historian, writing about the controversy concerning the celebration of Easter in Asia Minor, informs us, for the controversy is not only one concerning the day, but also concerning the very manner of the fast. For some think that they should fast one day, others two, yet others more. Some more overcount their day as consisting of 40 hours day and night. The Easter fast was extended to one week sometime in the early third century. This we learn from a letter written by Dionysius of Alexandria in the very early third century to a certain Vasilidis bishop of the churches in Pentapolis. We shouldn't be surprised that it took so long to get from one or two days or 48 hours to one week. 
Keep in mind that for the first 300 years or so of her history, the church was under severe persecution. Councils were not gathered easily, and communication between communities not as easy, of course, as it is today. The 40-day fast that we practice today was instituted sometime between 300 and 325. We know this because the fifth canon of the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea in 325 refers to it as an established practice. Scriptural precedence was employed surely to support this advance in the number of days. The most familiar examples in scripture are found in Exodus 34, 28, which recounts, of course, the story of Moses going up the mountain to receive the tablets of the law. 1 Kings 19, 8, about Elias and his stay on Mount Horeb. And, of course, Matthew 4, 2, which describes our Lord's 40 days in the wilderness. In each of these passages, emphasis is placed on the fact that a 40-day fast from food and water was observed. Later on, the Council of Laodicea in Canon 50, reflecting the conviction of the church regarding the benefit of the fast, expressly commands that it be observed without hesitation. We read, the fast must not be broken on the fifth day of the last week of Lent, in other words, Holy Thursday, and the whole of Lent be dishonored. But it is necessary to fast during all the Lenten season, eating only dry food. I say parenthetically, I find that interesting because when I was growing up, uh, most of us, would fast and go for Holy Communion on Holy Thursday. And once you take Holy Communion, the fast is finished. This was, uh, of course, a mistake, but no one, no one told us that it was a mistake. We, we connected the fasting with the act of taking Holy Communion. So I fasted, I take Holy Communion, so that's, that's the end of the fast, you see. And I was, uh, when I was researching it, and, 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 and that this is not just a problem for us in, in our, that then it was the 20th century, now the 21st century, but also in uh, centuries so early on in the life of the church. Most scholars agreed that the extension of the fast to 40 days undoubtedly had its origins in monastic communities. The development of practical asceticism and its relationship to spiritual progress, especially in the East, is one of the most significant contributions from the Desert Fathers and Mothers to the Church. Although Christian asceticism does not have its origins exclusively in monasticism, asceticism as one source informs us is derived from the Greek noun askesis, meaning exercise, practice, or training. The term's origin lies in the athletic arena, where victory was won by those who had best trained their bodies in their respective sports. Within Christian literature, it is but one of a number of metaphors borrowed from the world of athletic contests. And so we see in St. Paul made much use of such metaphors as we see in his second epistle to St. Timothy. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Primitive and early Christianity were indeed ascetical, following the example of our Lord who fasted and often went up into the mountain or out into the desert or wilderness to pray. The classic forms of monasticism familiar to us today arose in the late third and fourth centuries. In the second and third centuries before the conversion of Emperor Constantine, martyrdom was the ultimate expression of Christian commitment. As one historian explains, with the peace that ensued in the fourth century, 
and the concomitant influx of new members, Christians began to conform to the ways of the world. In this new environment, the monastic life developed in part as a statement against this growing conformity. The monks replaced the martyr as Christian hero, as the one who chose to die to a secular life. The primary objective of monasticism and its influence on Christian behavior beyond its own environment is to seek spiritual therapy for our fallen nature. As Hierobank Gregorius of Mount Athos explains, after the fall of the first form human beings, man's nature became gravely ill and much toil and effort on the part of man himself are needed to restore it to health. Saint Theodoros of Edessa, whose writings are included in the Philokalia, explains, for without great effort, one cannot uproot the soul's well-entrenched habits, nor indeed is divine knowledge to be acquired without effort. All Orthodox Christians are expected to observe some form of ascetic endeavor, especially during the Lenten seasons, in order to improve and maintain the integrity of their spiritual life. Canon law, for example, in regulating the requirements for participation in the life of the church, especially when it concerns spiritual and moral undertaking and principles, makes no distinction between in practice between clergy, monastics, and laity. We are all summoned to the same end. It is the Lord God himself who defines that end. God directed Moses, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God am holy. Eventually the path to this call to holiness would be defined by the church as purification, illumination, and glorification or theosis, as it is often called. Father Schmemann, in the fifth chapter of his book on Lent, challenges us to take Lent seriously. He asks, what could be not only a nominal, but a real on our existence? To answer this question, I turn to an insightful passage from a lecture given by Metropolitan Callistos Ware. He says, most people in our present day have a radically different perception of what asceticism implies. To them, it signifies not freedom, but submission to some irksome rules. Not beauty, but harsh rigor. Not joy, but gloomy austerity. Where does the truth lie? The case against asceticism is often stated, and it is thoroughly familiar to us all. Let us try to discover what we can say, what can be said in defense of the ascetic life. This we can best do by considering two basic components in ascetic practice, anachoresis or withdrawal and engratia self-control. Both of these elements, withdrawal and self-control, are essential to the monastic life. I suggest, however, that both are necessary for those of us living in this world as well. The term withdrawal can be awkward since nowadays it is used commonly to describe monetary transgressions, transactions, well, the transgressions many times, the monetary <laughs> things, monetary transgressions, transactions, or therapeutic initiative due to some sort of addiction. For a definition more suitable to our investigation, I turn to St. John of the Ladder. In the first step of this remarkable work, he writes, on the renunciation of life. All who have willingly left the things of the world 
have certainly done so for the sake of the future kingdom, or because of the multitude of their sins, or for the love of God. If they were not moved by any of these reasons, their withdrawal from the world was unreasonable. Three well-defined reasons for seeking a change in one's life. All three important to monastics and laity alike. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. In St. Basil's communion prayer, take away the heavy burden of my sins, O thou who takest away the sins of the world. Or in Matthew 22, 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. It's impossible in the context of one presentation to recount the innumerable treatises written or advice given by ascetic fathers and mothers to the subject of withdrawal. But it opens the door to a question relevant to us all. What can withdrawal mean for us who live in the world? I want to address this question by sharing with you one of the most penetrating descriptions I know that touches on the incentive for withdrawal in the monastic environment, but with equivalent import for us living in the world. In a way, it supplements the three reasons offered by St. John of the Ladder, and it takes it to a much deeper level. They, the monks, depart for the desert to visit with their self. The Greek word that is used here, episkepsasthe, is derived from visit, but it means also to look at observantly, to inspect, and to discuss with this self face to face, and naturally above all else, to speak with God, before whom they present their true being, devoid of every counterfeit image, image of themselves. They exchange the companionship of men for the companionship of God. What we're being told here is that to speak with God, I must first confront myself. Who am I? When seeking companionship with God, who already knows who I am, I must be prepared to accept the truth that emerges from such an encounter, that like all other fallen human beings, I too am in need of correction and healing. God knows that, but only when I acknowledge this fact and am prepared to divest myself of all my preconceived, neatly fabricated images of my distorted self, can the therapy begin. It's not easy to accept the truth about one's self and one's spiritual lapses. Often what is lacking is a failure to identif identify the root cause of sin. Our sins are more than simply breaks in moral judgment. They involve a darkening of the mind, a distorted use of free will, that very gift given us by God as a means of expressing either our love for him or something other than him. If you love me, keep my commandments, says our Lord. In a series of lectures, to college students some years ago, Metropolitan Kadistos, addressing the sacrament of confession, speaks of the need to stress the element of healing in confession, inspired, no doubt, by patristic literature, which often depicts the church as a hospital. His eminence describes confession as a time for true opening of hearts. What we bring to Christ, he says, is not a laundry list of sins, but what we bring is ourselves. 
we bring not just our sins, but our sinfulness. Because often there is a sinfulness that is far deeper than the specific acts we mention. But again, we do not isolate our sinfulness from our total personhood. What we bring to Christ in confession is ourselves, and we may need time to do that. Monk Moses of Athos of Blessed Repose, in an article <coughs> titled, Many Confess, Few Repent, hits the nail on the head when he writes, nowadays, prevalent are self-justification, excuses for our passions, beautification of sin, and its reinforcement through modern psychological supports. The admission of mistakes is regarded as belittlement, weakness, and generally, as generally improper. The constant justification of ourself and the meticulous transfer of responsibilities elsewhere have created a human being that is confused, divided, disturbed, worn out, miserable, and self-absorbed, taunted by the devil and captured in his dark nets. Both Metropolitan Callistus and Monk Moses are encouraging us in these two passages to engage in an analysis of the self that is honest, acute, and that can lead to an authentic realignment of our spiritual authorities. It's quite the opposite of the kind of self-help peddled in contemporary mislabeled self-help literature or, or on television shows. For example, one of the books that I perused when looking at this question of self-help, The Art of Self-Awareness. I don't know how they sell these things. They might make money writing these things. It's, it's amazing. The Art of Self-Awareness. Self-awareness is not simply knowing your name. It's knowing what makes you happy, what makes you sad, and the underlying beliefs and values that those emotions create. Here, there is no fighting against the principalities and the powers of darkness. It's about our emotions, a sentimentality wherein I am the center of my universe. There is a word in philosophy to describe this aberration, solipsism. And the solipsism means the view or theory that the self is all that can be known to exist. It's all about me. Do the Ten Commandments make me happy? If not, I need to adjust them or perhaps discard them. Do the Beatitudes help me sustain my core beliefs and values? If not, I can reinterpret them to suit my needs. Monk Moses does well to describe the results of this process as miserable, self-absorbed, taunted by the devil. I have no doubt that a great part of the problem afflicting humanity today lies in this kind of malignant self-absorption. It marks a loss of direction created by empty, fraudulent theories regarding man, his nature, and destiny. Indeed, if the self is all that can be known to exist, why bother with God? We can't discuss the long history behind this trend here, but beginning with the Renaissance, where the shift in emphasis from God to the, to the individual first began, to the Cartesian era expressed in the dictum, I think, therefore I am, suggesting that it is the capability to think that proves one's existence, not a divine creator. We see how the ground was set for the eventual dissolution of faith in God and the eventual dechristianization of Europe and the West. Now, I would like to propose that it is St. Andrew of Crete who helps us identify the root cause of this sad state of affairs. I came across it 
while reading his canon during the first week of Great Lent. In all of our churches, the canon is read in the evening. And I do not live near any churches and I don't drive at night very much anymore. So I was listening to Patriarch Kirill read it in Slavonic. And I, being a graduate of St. Tikhon's, I'm familiar with Slavonic and we had to study some Russian. And, uh, and I was able to follow him with my English translation. And he got to that part in the canon. I came across it uh, with a reading when uh, St. Andrew was 14 years old when he entered the monastery of St. Saba's near, near Jerusalem. I, I had the opportunity to visit that uh, uh, monastery twice. And uh, once you go there and, and worship and pray there, you can understand how someone like uh, uh, like St. Andrew coming out of that environment would be so intense in his spiritual life and ability to see deep into the, the soul, into the heart of the uh, individual and of the problem. His canon is one of the great hymnal hymnological treasures of our church. On the Thursday of the first week in Canticle 4 we read, I have become mine own idol, <clears throat> utterly defiling my soul with the passions. All we need to do is juxtapose this verse. I have become mine own idol, idol with the command, thou shalt have no other gods before you. And immediately we recognize the danger of putting ourselves before God. Yes, Lord, I believe you exist. I worship you in church. I do my best to be good. And I thank you, I'm not like everyone else. <laughs> Yet how often, knowingly or unknowingly, I set myself up against you. Thy will be done, I pray. Yet my will, in the manner of the prodigal, is the idol that unremittingly demands my attention. Just how wise were the fathers of the church when establishing the liturgical character of a content of Great Lent is seen in the Sunday's preceding Lent, one of which is dedicated to the parable of the prodigal son. The son represents uniquely the enduring internal struggle, our struggle, with the old Adam who so often rears his intimidating head with the same enticing whisper. All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. That's all you have to do. I'll give you whatever you want. Just fall down and worship me. Thus, the young man was deceived, the prodigal son, was deceived by his immature self-centeredness unable to correctly assess his capabilities, too weak to govern his life without the loving advice and supervision of his father. He snatches his inheritance and like Adam, in yet another self-imposed exile, journeys to a far country. It was not until he found himself completely destitute of virtue and nourishment that he came to himself. In other words, when he <coughs> took the decision to leave home, he was, shall we say, out of his senses. It took this catastrophic turn in his life to bring him back. His decision to return marks the most important step in his life. But it took much suffering, spiritual estrangement, moral deprivation, humiliation, before he finally came to himself. And we are reminded here of the desert saying, spit blood and receive the spirit. And that is what he had to do before he was able to return to the Father. He came to himself is, I believe, 
equivalent to two familiar dicks, dictums, one from Hellenic philosophy, know thyself, and the other from scripture, be attentive to thyself. It's not surprising that both made an impact on Christian writers from the earliest periods in church history. Saint Clement of Alexandria, late second to early, th early third century, writes, it is then as appears the greatest of all lessons to know oneself. For if one knows himself, he will know God. And knowing God, he will be made like God, not by wearing gold or long robes, but by well-doing and requiring as few things as possible. Elsewhere, he says, if someone wants to know God, let him first know himself. St. Gregory the Theologian, writing in the fourth century, credits self-knowledge as the key which opens the gates to repentance. He writes, you have a job to do, my soul, and a great one, if you like. Examine yourself. What is it you are and how you act? Where you come from and where you are going to end? And whether to live is this very life you are living or something else besides? You have a job to do, soul, by these things, cleanse yourself. And St. John Chrysostom, addressing the prerequisite for self-knowledge, describes it as a pathway to humility and all other virtues. He writes, he that is fond of outward glory and highly esteems the things present is not permitted to know and understand himself so that he that overlooks these things will easily know himself and having come to the knowledge of himself he will proceed in order to all the other parts of virtue. You see the difference between the church's approach to self-knowledge and what it gains as opposed to the self-help, self-knowledge of the secularists. Remarkable and important difference. Clearly, fondness for glory and love for things temporal are obstacles to self-knowledge. They impede the eyes of the soul from looking within where the kingdom is to be found. Saint Nectarius of Aegina, perhaps some of you saw the, the movie uh, of Saint Nectarius, extraordinary. If I may step a moment aside from, I saw it twice and I'm looking forward to getting the DVD because it's just the type of mo movie you can watch again and again and again, and you never tire, you know. The only thing that is tiresome is sin. Everything that is of God is, never tires you out. I mean, if it does, why do you want to go to heaven? Because what do you think they're going to be doing there? Is it by the worshiping God? And, and, and it, it's, well, Dostoevsky puts it best. He said, hell is the absence of love. And so if you love, then you want to be with God and with all of the saints and so forth. But in this movie, especially the actors who were playing some of the bishops, and the priests, they got them down so good. <laughs> I was, oh, did it bring back memories. <laughs> oh, yes, you know, especially the one bishop who gave St. Nectarius the uh, permission to uh, establish his monastery. But do, do you remember that scene? They were at the table eating. Poor, poor feeding his face, he couldn't stop, he was, he was not the small man, and, <laughs> and eating, you see, and he gave, gave the permission, and when I first saw the movie, I said, now, now that, that's, that's the kind of bishop you want, until later on, but it, it, from a historical point of view, uh, the first time I visited Aegina and St. Nectarius' uh, monastery was in uh, 1995, and 
the folks who took me there knew the um, Gerontisa uh, of the monastery very well. And she was uh, invited us into her office where she was actually getting ready to fax St. Nectarius' uh, constitution that he had written. He wrote a constitution for his monastery and wrote it in a way so that no hierarchs outside could bother the monastery. And she was faxing it to uh, of Blessed Mary Father Ephraim of Arizona. Because when he was trying to establish his monasteries in this country, he had a, faced a lot of difficulty, a lot of problems. So he wanted St. Nectarius' um, uh, constitution so that he could base his constitution for his monasteries in the, in, in the same way. But um, it, it's just absolutely extraordinary um, what he went through and how he was abused, never cursed, never struck back, and it was, it was just so peaceful and so kind. This is what we're striving to be. We are all created in the image and likeness of God, but in the life like St. Nectarius, you see what the likeness means, becoming like Christ, what that's all about. St. Nectarius of Aetina, in his book titled, Know Thyself, and th th this book is uh, in English. I, I don't have the English copy. I deal with the Greek copy, but it is in English. And, and uh, if you're interested, it's, it's, it's a wonderful text uh, to read. Um, he has a book, Know Thyself, and one, uh, um, I don't know how they translate it, I can't remember how they translate it in English, but it's on the, uh, uh, take care of thyself. And uh, both of them are uh, wonderful texts helping us uh, in developing our knowledge of God and how that ties into the spiritual development as well. St. Nectarius in this book, Know Thyself, offers us one of the most comprehensive works on the fundamentals required for forming a relationship between God and ourselves. He writes, he who knows himself knows his duties towards himself, towards God, and towards his neighbor, and that piety, justice, truth, and knowledge should be for him the touchstone on which he tests all his acts that have reference to God, to himself, and to his neighbor. For St. Nectarius, it is quite natural that we should desire to know ourselves since this possibility is implanted in us by God. We are living being capable of discerning good from evil with free will as well as the power to acquire knowledge. In creating us, God made us in his image so that he might seek him, so that we might seek him, draw near to him, know him, and love him. Like all the great fathers and mothers of the church, especially of the desert, St. Nectarius is well within the conviction given in scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The other dictum, be attentive to thyself, is taken from the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 15 verse 9. The most important work on this subject was authored by St. Basil the Great. For St. Basil, self-knowledge is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. That is towards the knowledge of God, which for him comprises true philosophy. Scrupulous attention to yourself, he advises, will be of itself sufficient to guide you to the knowledge of God. If you give heed to yourself, you will not need to look for signs of the creator in the structure of the universe, but in yourself, as in a miniature replica of cosmic order, you will contemplate the great wisdom of the creator. As a miniature replica of cosmic order, 
man as microcosm should remind us of our Lord's discussion with some of the Pharisees. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. There are many examples in the writings of the Father and the lives of the saints uh, that confirm this. Uh, there are only two that I'll mention. One is uh, a Romanian uh, priest, but not Father Calcio. Uh, I, I don't remember his name. Um, I saw his story on uh, a video about um, something else, and he was being interviewed. It was during the communist period, of course, in Romania, and because of his uh, preaching and so forth, he was uh, arrested and they put him in a cell that he could not stand up or lie down. He could sit down, but he couldn't stand up or lie down. No windows. The only time he saw any light was when they would open the little latch in the door to put some food in. Then he said something really profound. I couldn't, I, and, the, and the only time they turned the light on was when they wanted to see if he was still living. And he said, it was under those circumstances, not being able to look out to see anything, that I sat down and that's when I found the kingdom of God within me. I couldn't look out, so I had no other place to look. I looked in. And a tear streaming down his eyes. But what a powerful, a powerful statement. The other one is uh, Solzhenitsyn. It, I don't remember which um, volume uh, he wrote this. But of course, you know that in the gulags, in those camps that they had in the Soviet times, the um, purpose of these camps were to dehumanize the, 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 the person, completely dehumanize the individual. And uh, he was in this uh, small hut where prisoners were uh, stuffed in, uh, uh, seating around the um, perimeter of, the, of, the, of this hut with, pardon me, but the, 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 the latrine in the middle of the, of the hut. And yet he said there were some guards who had some humanity left in them and they would let them know it's Holy Week, Easter is coming. And the guard told him this Sunday is Easter. And he said it was under those wretched, horrible circumstances, the first time in my life that I actually understood, participated in, and enjoyed the power and the joy of the resurrection. You see? So these, uh, these happenings, these examples, uh, are good for us to, to know, to contemplate, to help us understand that sometimes we, we things are so easy, you know, for us. Um, but the church grew and flowered during the times of the persecutions. And we should never ever be afraid of the persecutions and be prepared because they're coming. Oh, you, you think the United States of America, who's gonna persecute us here? Oh, just wait. Oh, just wait. Just wait. Yes. Was it not the Obama administration that persecuted the little sisters of the poor because they, in their hospitals they would not allow abortions and his State Department relentlessly hounded those little sisters of the poor in our great democracy. It's coming, it's coming. 
And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are people who identify themselves as Christians, who support those things. And so our form of Christianity is made suspect. Why do you have to be so fanatical? You know, why be like everybody else? And of course, they always bring it down to that level of love everybody. If you see, for them, love is accept everything. Nothing, nothing, nothing is, is wrong. Nothing is sinful. Nothing is against the power and the majesty and the purity and the holiness of God. Accept everything, you see? Well, they're going to find out. And, and we will too, but this is how we will know. Are we going to stand with Christ in the church or not? A commitment to self-knowledge of this kind has its rewards, which directly impact the condition and state of the soul. Saint Basil explains, examine closely what sort of being you are. Know your nature, that your body is mortal, but your soul immortal, that your life has two denotations, so to speak, one relating to the flesh and the other, this life, one relating to the flesh and this life is quickly over, the other referring to the soul, life without limit. Give heed to thyself, cling not to the mortal as if it were eternal. <clears throat> Disdain not that which is eternal as if it were temporal. Despise the flesh for it passes away. Be solicitous for your soul which will never die. Early on, earlier on rather, we mentioned the need for withdrawal. And perhaps you might say, no, wait, Father, please. It's, it's not so easy for those of us living in the world. And, and I agree, I agree, it is, not, it is not easy. Except it is something prescribed by the physician of our souls and bodies. And we would do well to, to heed his advice. What does Jesus say? But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That, I propose, is withdrawal possible enough for those living in the world. Again, it's not always an easy thing to do, but if you haven't made an attempt or did and failed, I summon you to trust the call of the desert fathers and mothers, Valin Archim. I'll translate. Make a beginning. This is one of my most favorite sayings from the desert fathers. Make a beginning. It is uh, described, and rightly so, as a Copticism. You remember that the beginnings of monasticism were in the desert of Egypt, uh, and they spoke not just Greek, but many of these monks that were going out, like Anthony, spoke Coptic. But this Coptic um, uh, saying uh, came into the uh, Greek language as well, and it is established, therefore, as a phrase in Greek monastic terminology. We can't go on a journey without making a beginning. A little withdrawal by day by day is a good start. And I want to share with you some uh, examples from the writings uh, of two sixth century uh, monastics living in uh, Gaza uh, Barsanufius and John. This uh, collection of letters, 848 in all, encompasses correspondence written to people of all walks of life. Prominent characteristics featured in these letters are compassion, a hesitancy, a hesitancy to judge or condemn, sound judgment and advice, and a, on occasion, subtle humor. In 
letter 234. A brother writes to Barsanufius pleading, for the Lord's sake, forgive me, Father, that in my ignorance I have been ridiculed by the demons and pray that I might make a new beginning. I, love, I, I like very much that phrase, ridiculed by the demons. An interesting way of describing how we become objects of amusement for the evil one. We fall and they crack up. We fall and they're delighted. Barsanufius calms the brother's anxiety by offering him examples of repentance and forgiveness from scripture. Heed my words, he writes, and forgiveness will follow. Then Barsanufius, who is known as the great old man, uh, he is known as the great old man and John as the other old man, as he is known, records the ingredients of re true repentance and adds, since you said that you wish to make a new beginning, you give me joy as well. For the beginning is found in humility and fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is abstention from evil deeds. But make a beginning. Without making a beginning, nothing is possible. For the desert fathers, make a new beginning is indicative of the need for renewed zeal in combat against the inclination towards disobedience and sin. It is incumbent, therefore, on every spiritual combatant to refrain from the things that God hates. Humility and the fear of God are the levers that can propel the soul towards success. Some great advice in dealing with temptation to stray from God's path is offered by Father Artemy Vladimirov. This particular saying from a, a book that this, uh, he's a Russian priest who speaks English and he has a mission uh, in Russia uh, to English speaking people. And when, uh, when I read his book and I came across this, I had a, a, an icon uh, printed and on the back of it, I put this saying and gave it to my Sunday school kids because it is, it's a very, very good advice. He says, we are not to let sin master our nature. Our personal experience proves that in the battle against sin, we find peace only when we mark those boundaries that we will never again transgress. The moment we violate them, we begin to suffer. That is the suffering of our fallen nature, devoid of holy grace. All of our attempts are to be directed towards preserving this grace, to being in a state of war against sin, to being at peace with God. There is in the Apothegmata Patrum, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Um, Abba Piman said of Abba Pior that he made a new beginning every day. He made a new beginning every day. In letter 257, Dorotheus of Gaza, another great monk and abbot of <coughs> Palestine, confesses to Barsanufius writing, I have many sins and I want to repent, but my body is weak and I can't maintain the ascetic life of the fathers. I implore you, tell me how it is that I should make a new beginning. It's interesting that in his response, Barsanufius does not blame Dorotheus for his weakness nor does he harass him saying, no pain, no gain. He doesn't say anything like that. Once again, the great old man reaches into scripture and reminds Dorotheus that if you want to make a beginning for repentance, do this. 
Remember the example of the adulterous woman. In her tears, she washed the feet of the master. And Barsanufius further explains, weeping washes a person from sins, but it comes about with toil, together with great effort and patience, as well as by remembering the fearful judgment and the eternal shame, and by renouncing oneself as the Lord said, if anyone deny, desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And finally, in the last paragraph of the letter, Barsanufius offers some practical advice. He writes, if your body is weak, do whatever you can. Gradually abstain from bread and liquid, practice modesty, and you will be saved. Finally, in letter 614, and this is a particularly interesting letter, especially since we have a monastic uh, uh, brotherhood here, you see. A brother committed a fault and refused to uh, ask for forgiveness. The abbot prayed about it and told him to examine his heart. And when he is alone in his cell, you will discover whence this hardness came to your heart. The brother takes the abbot's advice and later emerges from the cell running to the abbot to confess his sins. He asks the abbot to ask Barsanufius to pray for him. The abbot writes to Barsanufius, who responds exposing the terrible thoughts in the brother's heart and the role of the devil which tempts us in these things. Do not cut off your hope, the great, the great Abba proclaims, for this is the joy of the devil. I have persuaded the Abba to receive you in his embrace as before, entrust yourself to him in everything, so make a new beginning from today, assisted by the hand of God. Behold, you are young, guard yourself, and do not give yourself over to foolish talk and useless acquaintances. That's sound advice for all of us. Do not cut off your hope, for this is the joy of the devil. The evil one is behind all thoughts of despair. He thrives on hopelessness. But despair is a passion that should forever be alien to the Christian heart. Do not fall into despair, counsel St. Isaac the Syrian. Because of stumbling, I do not mean that you should not feel contrition for them for stumbling, but that you should not think them incurable. For it is more expedient to be bruised than dead. There is indeed a healer for the man who has stumbled, even he who on the cross Ask, the mercy, ask that mercy be shown to his crucifiers. He who pardoned his murderers while he hung on the cross. All manner of sin, he said, and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. That is through repentance. And another profoundly comforting instruction is in the writings of St. Peter of Damascus in the 8th century. Should we fall, we should not despair. And so estrange ourselves from the Lord's love. For if he so chooses, he can deal mercifully with our weakness. Only we should not cut ourselves off from him or feel oppressed when constrained by his commandments. Nor should we lose heart when we fall short of our goal. Let us always be ready to make a new start. If you fall, rise up. If you fall again, rise up again. Only do not abandon your physician, lest you be condemned as worse than a suicide because of your despair. Wait on him, and he will be merciful, either reforming you or sending you trials, or through some other provision of which 
you are ignorant. On the last Sunday prior to the beginning of Lent, the choir chanted Adam's lament as he sat outside the gates of paradise. We read, Adam sat before paradise and lamented his nakedness. He wept, woe is me. By evil deceit was I persuaded and led astray. And now I am an exile from glory, woe is me. In my simplicity I was stripped naked, and now I am in want. O paradise, no more shall I take pleasure in thy joy. No more shall I look upon the Lord my God and maker, for I shall return to the earth from whence I was taken. O merciful and compassionate Lord, to thee I cry aloud, I am fallen, have mercy on me. God, my beloved, is not the author of death. Adam and Eve chose unwisely and brought upon themselves and their progeny the wages for disobedience of which they had been warned. God exp uh, explains, Father Romaniv is a Greek Orthodox theologian, did not impose death on man as a punishment for any sort of inherited guilt. God permitted death on account of his goodness and love so that sin and evil in man would not become immortal. What more can we ask of God who in his infinite capacity for love and forgiveness so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we might have life and life everlasting. And so I conclude and leave you with this thought. Please, please take time on Holy and Great Friday or on Holy and Great Saturday to sit quietly in the church before the tomb to contemplate the mystery of his suffering, the scandal of the crucifixion, the self-emptying that made his descent into Hades possible, as well as the joy of his anticipated resurrection. Meditate on these things, and in the spirit of Lenten bright sadness, allow the mystery of his death and the power of his resurrection to penetrate the eyes of your soul, to form in it a sense of mystical anticipation that will, in the darkness of the church on Resurrection Eve, erupt into a brilliant light that will proclaim a truth for all times, all peoples, all nations. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Any questions or any comments? Or? Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, what did you mean by wages of death? In Genesis, when God says to Adam and Eve, you may eat of any of the trees of the garden, but not of this tree. And if you do, you shall surely die. And St. Paul is saying that they disobeyed, and so the wages of their disobedience, the repayment of their disobedience, is death. Well, to know myself, two aspects, secular or spiritual. On the spiritual side for me to know myself is to know that I am created in the image of God 
and I am called to uh, imitate him. This is the likeness. Uh, man is created in the, it says in the Bible, man is created in the image and likeness of God. The, in, what do we mean by image? In whose image are we created? Christ. In, in the teaching of the Orthodox Church, the, uh, you can't uh, understand an anthropology of who the human being is. We, this is why St. Paul says that by adoption, we all become the sons and daughters of God. Because we are, through our baptism, through the sacraments of the Church, grafted onto the body of Christ, and this is how we become the sons and daughters of God. We are, we are created in the, because God is spirit. So how can you make such reference to what do you mean? What can you possibly mean by image? To know all of that, I have to know myself in relationship to these truths and how I accept them or reject them, you see. And if I accept them, then what am I going to do in order to fashion my life in a way that is consistent with what is asked of me by Christ, to live a Christ-like life. That's, that's what we're asked to do. Nobody said it's easy. <laughs> you know, it's never, never easy. But that's what we are called to do. We are called to, to imitate Christ. So St. Paul, for example, you, you, can, you can only imagine how, how difficult it was for St. Paul going to a place like Corinth. Corinth, uh, a port city in Greece, it was, it was well known for its debauchery, for its, 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 its fallenness, the sins and all that, that sort of thing. And here comes Paul and, and, and he's, he's talking about risen Christ and, and moral life and all this sort of thing. So what does Paul say to them? Imitate me because I imitate Christ, you see. And that's the whole, uh, I think, that's the whole purpose of, of the life of the church with all of the saints and, 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 and uh, the martyrs of the church and so forth and so on. We, uh, we, we, we look at a saint like Saint Nectarius and maybe I can, I, I don't expect that I'll ever be like him, exactly like him, but there is nothing preventing me from trying to be Christ-like, like him, in how I um, uh, govern my life, what I choose to do, what I choose not to do. You know, it, it comes down to, to all, all of these, um, uh, the decisions that we have to make in life. Let me give one example, for example. Um, many years ago in one of my parishes, there was a, a young lady who was uh, uh, an artist for some uh, publication. Good job, good money. And then she came and asked me, uh, Father, what should I do? About what? They want me to start uh, making the designs, the um, uh, for uh, some, um, it, it was um, ma black magic kind of thing in the, uh, that there were cartoons and stuff like that. And, and, and she was a very faithful person. She says, I, I can't do it, what should I do? And I told her, I said, well, you know what you should do. <laughs> you just want me to confirm what you should do, and, but I'm not gonna tell you to do it in your own mind. And she quit. She quit, she walked away. She said, I can't do it, I'm not going to do it. And she quit. And within a few weeks, she found another job. You know? It's, um, it's always that challenge of how am I going to decide using my own free will. The, uh, uh, God will never abuse our free will. He gave us the free will because uh, love, the, the, the main property of love is, is that it has to be freely offered. You know, I can't, uh, I, I can't force anybody to love me. You know, it ha it's, it's, he, he loves us freely and he says, love me. If you want to, if you don't, 
that's your, your decision, you know. Um, it's it's uh, our responsibility. So I think that this is self-knowledge, to know how am I going to govern myself. Um, because unfortunately, uh, in, in many democratic societies in the West in general, we, we, we talk about freedom what, without ever really knowing what it means, how to define it. You know, what, what do you mean by freedom? You are free to choose, that's all it means. Choose between good or evil. There's, there's no uh, freedom beyond that. You know, this, how, else could you, how, how else can you define freedom? You know, we, we have some of these uh, um, philosophers and the political philosophers talking about freedom, how wonderful it is. Yeah, freedom is wonderful, but what are you doing with it? You see, and how are, how are you using it in, uh, in your life? There's uh, some, how related to this, uh, an interesting uh, example from uh, one of the uh, Desert Fathers. He was a famous uh, Abba, father, and there was a young monk who was under the tutelage of uh, another uh, abbot. But he was not uh, governing things in the monastery correctly. And this young man went to the well-known, deeply spiritual abbot, and he's complaining. And he said, what should I do? And he said, go back. Go back. A few months pass, he comes back, the same story. He said, go back. Sent him back. Finally, the young man comes and says to him, Father, I'm sorry, I can't go back. I've decided. And he said, ah, now you can join. <laughs> <laughs> I decided. I decided. I have to decide. No one can decide for me. I have to decide. And don't think you can choose not to choose because you're not choosing as a choice as well. <laughs> Simple as that, you know? So to know thyself is to know what your uh, weaknesses, what your strengths, where, what you have to do to, uh, to improve those strengths, to uh, be careful not to fall into those weaknesses again and things like that. Yes, okay. Can we say, Father, that we learn part about ourselves through failure, ultimately? We should. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's disastrous if we don't. I mean, if I'm going, you know, this, if I know there's a ditch there and I fall into it and I purposely come by the next day and do the same thing, well, there's something, that, you know, so we, <laughs> we, should, we should learn, we should learn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and this is why I, I, I am so comforted by the compassion that we see in, the, in, in so many of the fathers of, of, of the, uh, the desert. Re read the sayings of the desert fathers. They, they, they come in different translations. Um, one of the best, uh, I th the translator I think is Benedict Ward. It's, it's alphabetized according to the names of the desert fathers and mothers. Um, and, and, and read the lives of the saints and said to us. For, for several years now, uh, I don't bother reading as much theological texts. I, th I think I've got that down pretty good. I, I, I know what I believe and what the church teaches. But I take great comfort in the lives of the saints and in the, the, the sayings of the, of, the, of the desert fathers and mothers. And they can, you can tell me, well, they're, they're living in the desert. It doesn't matter whether it's a desert out there in the sand of the desert here that you're living in Atlanta. You think Atlanta is not a desert. Lo lo look at the, 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 the way people live in Atlanta, the things going on in Atlanta. It's not a desert, it's a desert. You know. So, um, I, I, I get, and I'm deeply um, moved by, by their compassion 
by their patience, by their ability to forgive. There are so many stories from the Desert Fathers and Mothers um, where we never see them condemning someone else for sinning. They, they, they are always very careful about, about that. You know, I'll, I condemn myself. What he's doing, that's his business. You know? So, and this is, why, this is why the church offers us, why Christ gave us the sacrament of confession. Not, not just to come and unburden ourselves, I did this, I did that, but as we said, uh, as, as a means of healing, look at the church as a hospital where we come. He's writing about the Ark of Noah and he's comparing the, ark, the church to the Ark of Noah. And he says, whatever Noah took on the ark, at the end of the journey, that's what he released. The church takes thieves, harlots, liars, whatever it is. But at the end of the journey, what does the church release? Saints. And that's the one thing um, about our Orthodox Church, is that we have such um, veneration for the lives of the saints. Um, and why it's so good to have you, as you have here, all these relics of the saints. It, it was um, Metropolitan, um, oh dear, the, it, it, the, it, the Russian Metropolitan in, in, in London. Anthony Bill? Uh, yes. Uh, who said that relics are a sign of the only true materialism that we Orthodox can accept. It's the only true sign of materialism that we can accept. Because it's not, it's not just the soul that is purified and healed and made holy. It's the body as well. And that is manifested in the relics of the, of the saints. And everywhere that I have been, Greece, Russia, Palestine, uh, where, wherever I've been able to um, venerate relics, and so many of the times they all have that, that extraordinary aroma, that, that beautiful aroma of sanctity, you know. And, and you don't see that in the West and in non-Orthodox churches, you know making saints you know we don't make as much money as the Mormons or as the uh, some others you see but we make saints and I'd rather have the saints than all of the money in the world you see so Father, what were your thoughts about you mentioned as well you mentioned some of your own struggles um, in your career with Sort of Now's the time to like cut this <laughs> thing. <laughs> He's talking about bishops. We'll cut this off now. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm retired, but what's poor father uh, uh, Iwumi John going to do, you see, with his brotherhood? All, all we need now is for them to say that the brotherhood is, is, is against the bishops. That's it. Then you'll have to go to the desert. <laughs> I'm sorry. Please. So, question is, you know, what are your thoughts about how, how we, I mean, we're very fortunate here because we have, we have a sound place and wonderful priests and good hierarchs to my knowledge, but there are, you know, even in the modern church in different parts of the world, crazy things going on, of course. So how do we as Orthodox Christians kind of navigate that? It seems like it always is pushing me back towards what is kind of a seems to be a Protestant idea of, you know, the locus of knowing being within myself, you know, the orthodoxy, but only sort of in a theoretical sense, and I'm going to have to kind of judge the people that I'm supposed to be submitting to and obeying, making sure they're okay. 
You know what I'm saying? Do you understand the question? Yeah, uh, how, how do we live lives as Orthodox Christians when really we're kind of still the locus of making judgments? Well, we have to make a distinction between I judge and I condemn. This is the beauty of the Greek language. Kareno <laughs> is to judge. And we all have to be able to judge. Otherwise, you don't know if it's, this is good or that's bad. You have to judge. But when you add the preposition kata, kata karino, as they do in the scripture, that means to condemn. We have no right to do that. We have no right to do that. And so I, I, I think uh, that clearly our church is a hierarchical church. But that doesn't mean that um, any one individual, no matter what his station in life is within the church, has a right to abuse that authority or to scandalize anyone. See what I mean? Uh, in, in, in the Greek church, and in Antiochian churches and, and some other of these churches, you know, when you come into the church, there's always the bishop's throne. In the Russian church and other Slavic churches, the bishop comes in, he stands in the middle uh, in, in his flock. But if you look at the icon in the throne, it's always an icon of Christ as the high priest almost dressed in Byzantine style with mitre and so forth, vestments. I always thought that if I were patriarch, the first order I would give is that all of those icons be removed from the throne and an icon of Christ washing the feet of the disciples put in its place. And then, and then we know who, what is the responsibility of every individual, you see what I mean? We have to decide on these things um, because what are we going to do if um, some of our bishops decide that, that well, let's, let's have, you know, in this ecumenism, uh, uh, the ray for all the churches to become one. I, I am not opposed to the churches reuniting, as long as they become Orthodox. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's a wonderful thing. All of the Episcopalians, uh, I, think, I think they're lost, they'll they forget them. But, but, any, but any of them, to, to come back, to come back to Orthodoxy, eh, is fine, welcome. You know, I put uh, um, in the Twitter, somebody wrote in Twitter that the Russian Orthodox Church, the Patriarchate, is going to be expelled from the World Council of Churches. And I, I wrote in my Twitter thing, I said, what, thank God. <laughs> you know, this, this is the greatest day for Orthodoxy. Because our responsibility is not to pretend that we are equal with them, but to witness to them, this is the truth. You like it? Come on in. You don't like it? Go your way. Unfortunately, I'm not the patriarch. <laughs> and not everybody thinks the way I do. So that the day is going to have to come, and uh, maybe I won't be around by then, I don't know. Uh, but we'll have to make the decision, because if, if a union is affected, but it is, it, it is a false union, how are we going to follow this thing? You see what I mean? You know? And uh, just because a bishop is a bishop, it, it doesn't mean that, that he has uh, any better access to the truth than I do or anybody else. Nestorius was the patriarch of Constantinople. And, and, and he was condemned for heresy, you see? So we have to pray for them. 
always we pray for our bishops that God will guide them and so forth. But and this is why in, in the Orthodox Church we have the benefit of having the synod. It's not just one individual as you have in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, the, the one pope and, and he's infallible. The problem is our, all our bishops are infallible. <laughs> so they think they're, they're infallible. You know. But the time comes when somebody has to tell them, listen, buddy, you know, you, 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 th that's not the way it is, you know. It's, it's a very difficult uh, situation, especially for us clergy. You see, I can speak the way I'm speaking. I'm retired. <laughs> I'm not worried about anybody, you know. I'm retired. But what does that priest do that has five or six kids? And knows he'll lose his parish. And I've seen it happen. I've, se I've seen it happen. There, 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 there was, uh, unfortunately, I was not called to be, if I had been called to be on that spiritual court, the outcome would have been different, but I wasn't called to be on that spiritual court. Um, uh, what, I'm not going to say names or anything like that, but there was a priest who, in his parish, uh, and I had known him for a number of years, and, and I admired him, a, a really good man. And we have these parish council elections, you see, American democracy, we elect for the parish council. And this fellow wanted to run for the council, who was, and the whole community knew that this woman was not his wife, that they were just living together. And the, and the priest told him, I'm sorry, I can't let you run for the parish council under those circumstances. Unfortunately, he was from one of the prominent wealthy families in that community. They took him to the bishop. The bishop took him to the spiritual court. And he ended up, where was it? Mississippi. If somebody's from Mississippi, I'm not saying, the, you know, <laughs> the only thing is Mississippi. I, I heard it said one time that Mississippi is at the bottom, but you have to remember what is, whatever is at the bottom is holding you up. But, uh, uh, it, and it destroyed his family. Eventually his wife left, she couldn't take the pressure anymore. And, and, and it, it was a very sad state of affairs, you see. Only because he wanted to do the right thing. That I cannot, I, I cannot justify something like that. You see what I mean? I cannot justify that. And this, and this is, uh, and, and remember, I'm coming from the Greek archdiocese. The, the largest, the wealthiest archdiocese, so forth and so on. But if you take our bishops and you put them next to the royal court bishops, I see, I see Jordanville on one side and I see the country club on the other side. That's the difference. That is the difference, you know. And it's 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 sad. It really is sad, you know. Many people say that we should have married bishops. We should go back to the time of the early church, where some where some bishops were married. I, I'm I'm not in favor of that. No, I'm not in favor of that uh, because. I know how difficult it is to be a priest. You can imagine how difficult it is to have 40, 50 parishes that you're, 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 you're taking care of. And um, uh, in, in the bishop, if you see, who, if he's living a, a truly ascetical life, it, it's, it's a wonderful example for the community. I think in, in this country what happened is that uh, Roman Catholicism being the predominant um, uh, religion in this country, you know, we see the Catholic bishops, princes of the church, you know, they, they're treated like, print, like, like a prince, you know. And some of our bishops feel that, um, oh, that's nice, you know, look how, no, you're not a prince, you're a monk. Why did you become a monk to become a bishop? 
all the bishops are taken from the monastic life, live like a monk, you know? So I, I, I said one time, uh, we, 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 we build all of these uh, Episcopal res residences and offices all over the country. And I, I made a suggestion, it, the better thing to do was to buy, get the bishop, uh, uh, what do they call those uh, motor homes you can live in? But what RB, the, RB. RB, buy him an RB and let him go from one community to the next, <laughs> visiting his people, get to know his people. You know, why, why should I have to go to New Jersey? Five hour trip, New Jersey, the worst roads in the world, by the way, <laughs> and, uh, in New Jersey, and go up there to, to visit the bishop. Let him come down here. We're all down here. We're not up there. You know? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know. But um, the, these, are, these are the things that, uh, which right to look, look at this, look at this parish. I think it is remarkable, remarkable that, that you have a thriving parish and a brotherhood of monks. Because uh, I used to, they, they, they cut it off. Uh, I was watching uh, services from Russia every day of the week through the channel. They, they have a YouTube, so use YouTube channel. But it's, they, they took it, it's not available. But how many times they would show monasteries in Moscow or Petersburg that are right in neighborhoods, right in neighborhoods. What, what a wonderful impact that has, I think. Let, let, me, give you, uh, let me give you an example. In my last community, it was a very, I, I retired from Atlanta and I went back to Falls Church, to uh, Virginia, uh, and the bishop asked me if I would take a, a very small parish that had been going for just four years or so. They never had a full-time priest, but they couldn't afford a full-time priest. That didn't matter to me, whatever you can, well, uh, and, and I'll serve you. For 10 years I served them. Well, we were having a, uh, it was in June, um, the, the summer Bible thing for the kids. And I had just finished saying the prayer and someone came to me and said, Father, there's a, a, a young girl who, who just came and she wants to speak to you. Well, it was a young girl from St. Petersburg, Russia. Unfortunately, her parents are divorced. Her father lives in uh, Virginia and her mother in St. Petersburg. And she had been uh, with him to visit him in the summer for a couple of months, and he kept promising her, I'll take you to church, I'll take you to church, I'll take you to church. But that means going into D.C., which is not easy, uh, for uh, the Royal Court Church, St. John's in D.C. So this girl went on the internet, found our church, and walked over five miles to get there to light a candle. Thank God we were there. Because it's a small, it, 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 it was like your church when, when I was over living in Tucker and I used to come to like that place. Uh, that, that's the setup that we have. And there's not always somebody there. And she walked all because she had to come and pray and light a candle. So my wife and I took her home. She lived, lived not far from where I live in Ashburn. And so as I was talking to her, she was telling me, you see, th this, is, this is the benefit of living in, a, in an Orthodox country where there are churches all over the place. And I know because I've, I've been to St. Petersburg. Uh, I went to Russia in 1988 for the millennium. And um, she told me both she and her mother Every day on the way to school and to work, they stop at such and such a church. Her mother's favorite church was church. We celebrated liturgy in St. Nicholas, uh, Nikolska Sabor. The, that, that, the altar of that church was so large, it was half the size of my church in, in, in uh, St. Catherine's. And, uh, and um, I think of our kids. How, ma how many of our kids are able to do that? 
how many of them are able to do that? And how many of them would walk five miles to light a candle? You know, that is why we have to work so hard to instill in our children a love and devotion for the faith because it is the only thing that they have that are going to keep them on the right track in life. You know, I, I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We walked to church. Our whole life was around the church. You know, my brother and I, twice a week, after American school, we go to Greek school. We went to, 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 for choir practice and all that kind of stuff on Wednesday evenings and, and, and so forth and so on. Um, but we were an urban church with an urban community. In the suburbs, that's almost impossible uh, to do that. Or one year when I was in Athens, in Greece, and I went to the metropolis, the cathedral. It was in January. And I was really impressed. Uh, all of these kids coming in, uh, lighting candles, lighting candles. So when I went back home, the folks that I was staying with, and I told them how impressive they, they burst out laughing. They said, Father, it's exam week in the universities. <laughs> <laughs> exam week in the universities. They're, they all go into the church to light a candle before they go take their exams, you know? So, um, Unfortunately, we can, how, how can we do that here? So what do you teach the kids to do? Light the candle, light the visual light in the house before you go for the exams. Do light it in the house. Light, light the incense, at least on, on Saturday night. Sense the house, at least on Saturday night. Do, do these things that, that will, will, will keep the traditions of the faith uh, and will help them understand the need to, um, to preserve these things as, as their lifesaver. You know, these are the things that will, will, will help them um, in, their, in their own life as they're, as they're developing and uh, maturing. Yeah. Anything else? Father, so good Extend it for you. Father, will read us uh, through our feast also. It is truly meet to bless thee, the day of souls, ever blessed and most blameless and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim. And beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave his birth to God the Word, the very Theotokos seemed to be mad. 